Hey everybody, wanted to welcome you to Man Parish Studio and we have a real legend here. Yeah, we do. Legend. Wow. Yeah, well, listen, if I did half the shit that you did, I think I'd be called a legend too. Um, this is Mark Berry. Um, he's a musical producer and back in the day an engineer. I'm sure he still engineers. We're going to talk to him. He's got, uh, well, first of all, he worked on Hip Hop Bebop. So all you guys out there that uh, uh, know Hip Hop Bebop, you will get to uh, talk to him. He's the guy that's responsible for making it sound good. Well, I was too, because I recorded at home, but he made it sound great. Um, we're going to go through Wikipedia, and um, that's not always accurate, as you guys know, and I told Mark. And uh, I've known Mark for, God, like 30... No, 30, it's been uh, four, 40... 40, years. ow, ow! <laughs> four, 40 years next year. Wow, years. wow, 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 yeah. wow. Well, at least you have brains and you can count. At my age, I can't. I'm going to read... Yeah, we met, we met in 79... Right, and then uh, was it, then the rec was the record it, came out in eighty. When when did the uh, rec, no the record came out in eighty two? So it must have met in eighty or eighty one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Eighty. Eighty one. Yeah. It, it was the end of the year, actually. All right, you guys. We actually started here. I wanted to read his credits, but we'll do a couple of seconds. Uh, Hip Hop Bebop um, was recorded, I think, uh, over the summer. I remember it being very very warm because I had to carry my massive. Uh, a track half inch tape recorder uh, yes, in a cab, yes, yes, yes. I remember, in a cab yeah. to Vanguard Studios to transfer the A track. And I remember it was so hot outside. So, probably July, <laughs> August, and then September, and then maybe October or so, we wound up mixing it down and it was out by November. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Uh, we'll talk about that in a couple of seconds, but I just wanted to let you guys know what Mark, who he is and what he's done. So I had to go to Wikipedia because Mark's done so much stuff. Um, Mark Berry is a music producer, and of course I know an engineer, who has 36 international gold and platinum uh, record awards. Wow, I only have, I don't know if you can see there, I got two and one off to the side, three. <laughs> and that's for Crystal Waters, and I didn't even work on the record, and that's my man to man. And another one I had to make myself because I was never paid. I had to make my own gold record. So he's got 36 <laughs> of them up on the wall. You can see a few... Uh, over uh, over behind him, which is great. Um, and it says uh, you've worked with David Bowie and Duran mm -hmm. Duran, Billy Idol, my wonderful friend boy George. Yes. 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 <laughs> uh, yes Joan Jett, Cameo, and Cool in the Gang. That's that. that that's pretty freaking amazing. And maybe you could just touch on a couple of those things in a minute. I just want to go through your experience. And it said um, that you went to London and um, you wound up working with George Martin. So did you just like get off of a plane and knock on a studio door? George Martin was there and said, I want to, you know, I want to do your coffee or something like that. No, no, no. What, what happened was uh, I, I, I didn't want to go to Vietnam. Right. So uh, that was a, a horrible war. Every night we were watching Walter Cronkite with the family and, you know, body bags rolling off the planes every night at seven o'clock yeah, yeah. and uh i and i i looked at my parents i said listen they're gonna grab me <laughs> without a doubt because so you know I'm, we had the draft i'm out of draft here. going so yeah I'm out so of here. uh my brother david uh, my older brother david joined the navy so he was you know sitting in the middle of the pacific ocean he was pretty safe and um uh, and i went to the institute of audio research right. on my junior and senior year um commuting back and forth into Manhattan, um, uh, going to this uh, school on on University Place, just uh, just north of NYU. And uh, Could I ask you real quick, because a lot of people sure. listening are junior engineers and junior people like that. I tell people they don't really need those type of school. In, in, in our day, it's different because we didn't have recording studios in our bedroom. I tell people, should I spend tens of thousands of dollars going to these things? I tell them, no, get a Mac, go get Logic or, or one of these things and you yeah. can learn that way. What's your feeling now yeah, well, my, about that? My feeling kind of now is, uh, you know, get behind the wheel and drive the car. Exactly. You know, so just just, just real, do it. Don't spend the money. Just, just do it. Sp you no, can spend... These, these schools are charging twenty eight, thirty thousand dollars and you know, they're spitting them out, you know, left, right, and center. And and, and you can buy a Mac setup for, for five, three or five grand and, and be yes. just as, just as, yes. and you can learn at your own pace in your underwear. 
Absolutely. Didn't mean Absolutely. to break your train of thought, so I just wanted to cover that because a lot of this is a master class, and kids are uh, kids. People are just trying to learn how to make music, and you know, yeah. I, I wanted to. And stop then it. you know, I, I do believe in the mentorship uh, thing, which is how uh, I wound up in England. So I registered for the draft. I turned eighteen in high school, my senior year. Registered for the draft. Graduated a month later, and the day after I graduated, I was on a plane to London, England. Great. Basically, I got a letter of recommendation from Irv Deal, who was the owner of that of that school, Institute of Audio Research, which which I believe is now closed. And um, and uh, you know, I, I engineered some some you know classes were done at Vanguard Studios. Right. Coincidentally, I wound up working there for yeah, yeah, ele yeah. eleven years. We'll talk about uh, that the studio and the history in a little bit. Yeah, and then uh, so I was in England, and I was just. Uh, I rented a room uh, in Ridgemont Gardens in Leicester Square, and wow. I, just I just walked the streets of London for two weeks, and I in knocked on doors. <laughs> 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 and, and you know, funny story. I, I went to I, you know, I wrote down all my favorite studios on the back of a you know that were on you know Trident Studios, yeah. Air Studios, Olympic Studios. And, um, I got to work at Every Road, so I got to be in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and, yeah. and Every Road was one of one of the yeah, studios yeah. I pounded on, and then uh, I got invited in. I went back. I went to Air Studios in Oxford Circus, and that's a uh, church. They, is that correct? It's a church. Air is a no. Church? The the new one is a church. Oh, the new uh, one is a, because it's the, no the, longer on on Oxford Circus. The it's, reason it's I asked because a lot of sample companies. I work with ATO and some other companies, and I've seen. Uh, I can't remember the company. They always use that, and I was surprised to see it. I know they use different environments, but it's a church because they do a lot of orchestral. Yeah, recording. it's a church now. Uh, it's over in Wimbledon, by Wimbledon, uh, by the uh, tennis uh, uh, area. So, um, so I went to this. Uh, you know, I went to studios, and you know, I, I went to Trident Studios, and and walked into the lobby, and there's sitting Elton John and Gus Dudgeon, and and this is 1972. Wow! You know, like, wow! Yeah. Wow. And, uh, and and I asked them, I said, you know, can I come in and hang out? And it was like, they're looking at me like, I'm like, what are you, fucking nuts? Yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. So I just uh, I just walked around, pounded on doors, and uh, I went to Air Studios, and they said, come back. So I came back, and when I came back, coincidentally, there was no receptionist in the lobby area. <laughs> so you got to sneak in. <laughs> so I walked in, to, yeah. uh, and I, I met an engineer, a uh, kid <clears throat> just like myself, uh, his name is Nigel Walker, and he invited me into an Alan Clark session, who was the lead singer for the Hollies. Yeah. And they had just come off a huge record called Long Cool Woman in yeah. a Black Dress, which Big is record. a monster, uh, monster uh, record. international record. And here I am with Brinsley Schwartz on drums, Alan Clark, uh, uh, D. Murray, the bass player for yeah. Elton John. Of course, yeah, like the, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The biggest studio guys around, right? And, and, uh, and I just basically... Uh, came back every day i asked if i could come back you're not getting and, uh, but uh, i want to let people know you're not getting paid you're just hanging out i'm just uh, hanging out what, what would, you, it wouldn't even be an apprentice yeah 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 exactly i'll do that for you, you. Pack a cigarette? you yeah. want a coffee i'll go get a coffee yeah yeah a i just no want to be here i'll do anything yeah i got it yeah, yeah. yeah and that's what i did and then uh they came to me uh joyce moore who was the studio manager and uh they took a liking to me and uh and i started uh working there and they were paying me uh you know 30 pounds a week um, I, I couldn't even do that. What was that like a hundred bucks or something like that? Yeah, it's like a yeah, hundred yeah, bucks. Yeah, a yeah. great, oh, fantastic, you know? great. So and it was paying my it was paying my rent. And uh, so what did you they start, what did you do that, during that time? I, I, I mean, what, I know you were like getting coffee, but were you in any big sessions or were they some smaller yeah, sessions or yeah. maybe? So, can so you basically, remember? what they did was uh, I was rolling up cables, setting up mics, uh, putting up the booths, uh, the isolation booths. Uh, making sure the headphones work. You were uh, really in the in the trenches. Great, but that's actually right but that's actually great as an engineer because you understand the process. If you put too many cables back in those days, you would have line noise. Uh, yeah. you, you, you learned about grounding to get rid of right, hum right. and all that kind of stuff. So that's exactly. a really great exactly. way to learn your craft. And I tell people, you can you, you now we have samples. You could drop stuff in. You fruity loops, or, or you could drop loops in. You have samples, but in our day. Uh, we, you, you, you made, we made the samples. A lot of yep, those samples yeah, are coming to, off of recordings we did. Create, you had to create a good drum sound. Yeah, you, know, you had so. to make your drum sound with a microphone in a, you know, in a kick drum or you, 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 you were that hi hat. You had to know the angle to mic it, and you had to learn Absolutely. your, you had to learn your microphones because some microphones. I'm, I'm telling this for people that don't understand. Some microphones had a wide stereo sound. Some had narrow.
narrow omni cardioid yeah. semi cardioid yeah and some of those microphones would distort at high levels and some would dis uh, designed to take high pressure in front of guitars and kick drums so we had to learn this part of our craft so yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know absolutely uh, that's how you become so, a good engineer anyway go ahead i must explain so, so, it to we said, so basically i was just uh, you know uh, just an assistant engineer and then i got to uh operating the actual tape machine well what sessions um, did you work on during that time any okay any, so uh well some of the first ones were uh uh i did an album with uh, eric clapton and stevie wonder sure. which never got released uh okay. due to contractual issues mm -hmm. okay. my i did uh, the live and let die soundtrack with mccartney and wings stop okay yeah, that's yeah. a that's a biggie yeah. so did you do and that on with, your uh, George Martin producing, and uh, you know that's a sixty-piece orchestra, and so so know. were you in the hot? Were, were you assistant engineer? You know uh, 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 what was the? I board? was an assistant engineer. I was assistant, you know, because you know on that sessions we had a you know sixty-piece orchestra, and you know you had to set up not only mic cables but ashtrays and. Uh, well, I want to let uh, people know setting up for an orchestra is a way big di a big difference than setting up a band or a singer because you have microphones that have to record in areas absolutely and you have to absolutely. make sure that maybe sound from somewhere else try to get it as yeah. isolated as possible without cutting off the orchestra from hearing other places so it, it, it it's a whole art form in itself miking an right. orchestra is not just putting two mics and you capture the sound it's a whole complex and array of microphones so i just I'm, exactly i'm, I'm trying exactly. to let people know this yeah, anyway. so, so basically setting up for an orchestra like you said is it's a, it's a big ordeal you know you have to have extreme cardioid you know uh mics that that's just hone in on the viola sound and just hone in on the cello sound. And can so, you tell people why? Because afterwards you want to be able to blend those sounds. Yeah, yeah. To you get want to be mix. able to mix mix it all together right. and, and, and create an orchestral sound. Yeah, yeah you, you want know? to be able to control different sections and bring them up and down as needed. That's yeah. the reason. So Studio A in uh, in uh, Air Studios on Oxford Circus was a massive, massive uh, uh, room space yeah, space. Yeah, 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 you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's where they did all the orchestral stuff. And they had like four studios in there and, and a listening uh, area. So I did that. And then they stuck me a lot with the uh, the American uh, clients because I was uh, uh, American you spoke from, my language. <laughs> from New York. You, know? you can and translate. They put me with, uh, they put me with uh, a girl named Carly Simon. Wow. And, uh, the No Secrets the, album, yeah? The No Secrets. And uh, that was uh, the first record I got my name on. Is it was Sylvain. Oh, I was just going to say it had your so great. So, uh, were you assistant engineer or engineering, or did I, you mix? Or? I did. I did both. I did a bit of both. Uh, great. Uh, a lot of assisting, uh, and uh, you know, a lot of uh, just you know helping Mick Jagger walk down the hall. I, I, I was just two hammer. Yeah, I was just going to say. So you know, what's the Mick Jagger story? Is you know, you know, uh, well, Mick was. Uh, Actually, Mick wasn't even supposed to sing that night. Mick was actually hanging out with a guy named Harry Nilsson. Yeah, who, uh, a was, guy named, was a, yeah, yeah, a, a yeah, great, yeah. great American songwriter. And his album, Nilsson Schmilson, was produced by Richard Perry. And Richard was producing the No Secrets album. So Harry Nilsson uh, came by to do some vocals, some background work on the Carly Simon record. But Nick and Harry were plowed plowed fucking drunk so yeah 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 right? yeah you know harry uh, those are the days harry, of rock and roll you know <laughs> yeah yeah and harry passed out in the lobby because uh, he was so drunk and as you know he died from alcoholism yeah. it was a it was a big issue with harry yeah. uh okay. so they asked mick if he wanted to sing uh the background part and uh so mick went in and you can actually hear mick's voice come in in the second chorus and the outro chorus all and, right folks go ahead and go stream it someone will make 0.025 cents, but go, <laughs> go cue that up when they can listen, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, it's, so it's Mick Jagger. And then uh, at the end of those sessions, we all piled into a cab. This is like 3 o'clock in the morning and went over to Olympic Studios where they were mixing the live 72 tour tapes from this Rolling Stones tour with uh, Andy wow. Johns. Wow. Uh, are, these, are these 24, 48 tracks? Uh, these, these, are, these are 16 tracks. Wow! This is before 24 track. Well, 24, the Air Studios in 72 had gotten the first 24 wow. track in London. All right, so guys, if anybody's listening in that's just a bystander, doesn't know about music, we have tape that had, at, back then, that had individual tracks. So you could put your vocals on one track, your drums on another track, so on and so on, guitars and bass or orchestra, and you were able to blend all these sounds together. We have 24 tracks. Actually, with digital, we have hundreds of tracks. But mm -hmm. back in those days, we were limited by the technology and the width of the tape 
and 16 track. Wow. What? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And you had a little more uh, headroom, of course, because yeah, because the, uh, analog. The, ta yeah. the tape gap was wider, and uh, you could just saturate the tape with a little more level and sound. And, and was that a thirty IPS, uh, sixteen? Uh, do you remember fifteen IPS? Yeah, yeah. We, we always operated at thirty IPS or fifteen with Dolby. Oh, so a lot of that was Dolby. So a IPS, Dolby, folks, yeah. is how fast the tape spins, and the quicker it goes across the head, the more it smears it across the tape, so you get better quality. If you go at a smoother speed, they have to compact more audio into a smaller space, so right. the quality deteriorates. I'm just helping people understand. Yeah, the, so the slower the tape speed, the more uh, tape noise you hear. The faster the tape speed, the less tape noise, because it's going yeah. uh, across the heads faster. Faster, yeah. Right? You're, you're smearing it out, like a, like a good right. old bagel and cream cheese. You're smearing it. So, uh, so then I did that for, uh, for two years uh, at Air Studios, and uh, I worked with many great artists, uh, Climax Blues Band. I did the Electric Light Orchestra, I, Rollover Beethoven album. Great. Well, are, you, are you engineering? Are you assistant engineering on that? I'm just assisting. Okay. Uh, that's all I'm doing. Uh, just, and, just assisting. And, 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 you know, once in a while, getting in the hot seat. And, you know, yeah, yeah, you know, I know. Yeah, yeah, At 18, sure. 19. It's yeah, like, yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Like, I and, and, how to drive the car. You did uh, 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 Deep Purple, I see. Uh, you worked with yep. uh, uh, Bill Price, you did Sex Pistols, uh, um, yep. John yep. Punter, which was Japan, Reflex, Brian Ferry, Roxy Music, Steve Nye, Roxy Music, yep. Alan Harris, T Rex, Mark Bowen, Mata Hoople, Jeff Emmerich, The Beatles, uh, Chris Thompson, Elton John Pretenders, Pink Floyd, and Excess. Just Lind, ELO, Tom Petty, Traveling Will. Yeah, you smile, right? It's pretty amazing listening to this. Uh, you, you know, we do this stuff and we. We, we don't carry this over our shoulders every day. When you sometimes hear somebody read back this, you go, wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Martin Birch from uh, uh, Iron Maiden, Deep Purple, and Tony Visconti. Um, yeah. What did you do? Was he working on Bowie stuff when you worked with him? Or was it no, uh, Tony was working on his, uh, do you remember his ex-wife, Mary? Um, oh, shoot. I forget all, all right, so she had an album or something? And yeah, he, uh, he was married to a, a woman named uh, Mary. She had a, a big pop hit uh, in the early 70s. And uh, and Tony was working on another record with her. They're divorced now, mm -hmm. uh, but he, yeah, he was producing uh, another uh, another record with her. And was he nice to work with? Easy to work with? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, a, cool. A dream, right. a dream. Cool, cool, cool. Well, you definitely got to. You, you had a great. You're very lucky. You had a great education with a lot of really good people. A absolutely. I mean, it's I a blessing. I was thrown. I was thrown right into it. Uh, literally thrown right into I it. I also want to say because you were in major studios in a major city, unlike today when everybody records at home, these major groups had to come to this one or two or three studios to get stuff done. And the fact that you were working there, you got to experience all these people. You know, it, it wasn't like there were 30 or 40 or 50 studios or they all had Mac or PC setups at home. They had to go to these places. So you would definitely, you were so lucky you were at the crossroads of all this music Absolutely. history. And, and you're seeing how, uh, how how different engineers and producers work. So, for example, like that night on Carly Simon's uh, sessions when Jagger came by and we all piled in this cab and we went to Olympic Studios. So here I am, they're mixing the 72 tour tapes for uh, for the Rolling Stones uh, concert tour. And I'm just kind of wandering around Olympic Studios saying, holy fuck, Olympic Studios, this is where like Led Zeppelin records, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm outside in the, in, the, in the studio area and I see this huge drums and they're on a riser about three feet off the ground and the mics are underneath the riser and, and I'm looking, I go, so I go in and I was talking to Andy, just shooting the shit. I think I, I know what you're going to say. And I go, you know, wow, that's really, really in, 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 incredible setup there. Like, what, what miking techniques? Was, was it <laughs> for goes, Queen? We were rocking? No, no, it was uh, John Bonham's drum setup. They by mic'd Eddie Kramer. It underneath the right. Well, I mean, they, they mic'd them on top, but oh, you, remember oh, that? Oh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. That was, you know, Mike's eight, 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 Neumann 87s were underneath this three foot gap. Just and like you go. Oh, so yeah, I want to say that's so, so. As a good engineer, somebody had to think they wanted to get a low thump, and they they got it coming out of the kick drum. But someone said, "Oh wow, there's going to be a standing wave, or there's going to be some sort of a, a sonic boom underneath there." There's going to be a used, thump. There's yeah, gonna be and a they used thump. their brain to actually yeah. record that onto another track that they could blend with a kick drum. Yeah. So if Absolutely. guys, if you're using samples, just letting you know, I do it. I have a kick drum, and then sometimes I'll have something underneath it to give that more weight. And in those days, you didn't have sub 
harmonic synthesizers and a lower sample you could throw in. So we, the, again, another example of how it was made. But an engineer had to use their mind and think of that because that was not a standard practice. Correct, just, correct. Just pointing these things out. So after you did, uh, uh, we'll take any other stories that you want to tell and then I want to move to when I you mean, went basically to I learned, you know, that was my uh, training ground. Uh, the summer of uh, 72, uh, Congress voted not to send any more troops uh, to Vietnam and said, hey, you know, let's let's figure a way out of this mess. And, uh, you know, Saigon fell in 74. So I came back in 74 and uh, I just walked the streets. God, uh, you're with fucking this old. <laughs> with his resume. Right. And uh, well, and then I was just that's a pretty good that, 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 that's a pretty good resume to walk the street. You're walking the yeah. streets of New York with that resume. So did anybody I, I know you I know you're from Vanguard, but I mean, were you at Hit Factory or Electric Lady? Yeah, I was at Hit Factory, uh, uh, Record Plant, uh, uh, you know, I got, Electric Lady. I got just, just doing uh, sessions, you know, just uh, uh, and uh, doing assisting engineer sessions. I, I got to hear David Bowie's Young Americans off the 24 track. My friend Cherry Vanilla was playing around the corner at Trudy Heller's on 9th and 6th Avenue, and Bowie came in. Trudy Heller's? Yeah. yeah. Uh, 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 Cherry said, someone special's coming. I'm like, whatever. All of a sudden, Bowie walks in. The place goes crazy. Go back to the dressing room with Ava Cherry, David Bowie, and this handsome black guy, unknown, called Luther Vandross. Right, because wow. Luther was a yeah, back yeah. Luther was a background singer, you know. Yeah, he was and, a big session singer but, in New York, yeah. and he did the backgrounds on Young Americans, right? So uh, after the hey, let's go over to the studio, which is around the block, and we all walked over, and I think half of New York City followed us over because David Bowie's in the street, you know what I mean? And they're all yeah, yeah, high and coked up and smoking weed, and we get into the studio, and uh, they're sitting there, with air kisses and doing coke, and I'm like, wow, you know, like this is wow, yeah. in my first studio, right? I, I knew I was a to music uh and he said i want to play something we just did this and he leans against the board and presses play and it was a rough mix of uh, uh of young americans and it did that's pretty great, amazing man. but i remember looking through the studio they had a huge synthesizer bob margoloff and malcolm cecil had a group called tantas expanding him and they had this massive moog thing and i was no longer interested in david bowie or cherry vanilla or them i went out there right, and right, I, right. I just prayed to the synthesizer being a synthesizer <laughs> you know what i mean so yeah uh, yeah I, re I, I remember that quite well wow so um uh you you, you work for these studios assistant engineer and yeah, just basically on call assisting uh, on uh, just uh, uh, open sessions, uh, learning my just learning my craft, really. I, you know, I wasn't really fully engineering at that point. Uh, I was just kind of setting up mics, uh, winding up cables, sweeping the studio floor, emptying ashtrays. That's what I was doing. And, you know, you, hung, you know, if Manny, if you hung out in these studios and, and you kept your eyes open, and 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 ask the right questions at the right time yeah uh then you learned a lot you yeah, really yeah, did because, yeah, yeah. you know you know i'm hanging out with eddie kramer and like yeah okay eddie kramer is great you know it's like and i'm hanging out with john punter and john punter's great and i, I want to say john if you're watching this you need to learn your craft so you may want to google some of these names pause or go back and write down some of these names because how you become good is you learn who these people are. You need to stand stand on solid. I tell people you need to stand on a solid foundation. So if you know your Absolutely. history, you have a strong foundation. You can become much better at what you're doing. Absolutely. So if Absolutely. these names are flying by you and you don't understand them, please Google them or or, or, or learn some history on this, and it'll help you become better. Wow. Yeah, because I mean these are the pioneers of of audio engineering. That yes. We were, that we were working. With. These guys were like in the thick of it. Right. Yeah. They were creating the sounds that we listen to today and go, holy shit, listen to that drum sound. Yeah, it still yeah. sounds great today. Yeah. Well, hip hop, I get compliments all the time on hip hop bebop and how great it sounds. And I love a story that you told me. We're going to talk about Vanguard in a minute where Arthur Baker came in and- uh, <laughs> I was going to tell you Do you, you want to tell that story? You want me, yeah, yeah, well, so, so well, we well, use, well uh, should we save that for a second? I just want to talk what Vanguard Studio was and then we can edit yeah, or we yeah, can- Yeah, sure. Okay, so Vanguard Studios, I like to call the Muscle Shoals of New York City for all these right. great, electronic um, it was called hip I tell people hip hop isn't what it is today in those days hip hop was electronic dance music and rap was rappers delight and that sort of thing then it became one later on but hip hop was uh, uh, African Bada, uh, Man Parish, yeah, yeah. Freeze Force, AIU, Shannon that was considered yeah. hip hop which was happy fun club dance music and Absolutely. then rap was Absolutely. a totally different thing and then it kind of all became one thing so Vanguard Studios you went to work at but I consider that like the muscle shows there's a whole history there of electronic dance music that's kind of going away and I want to 
do some sort of a documentation of like this was the place to go for two reasons other places work there you as an engineer knew how that how to handle an early machine like an 808 and samplers you knew how to get yeah, yeah. sound out of it but also it was the cheapest place in town to record because Absolutely. vanguard had rent that place out for like 25 an hour from midnight to well, in the I, morning I, I, you know I, I what I mean? in charge of it right so i would i would cut the deal yeah uh, I mean, and, and maynard was happy the president of vanguard because, because it's that empty right it's that empty most of the time because it was a large space i mean before it was the uh, ballroom yeah the carteret hotel which was the building and, above yeah, it was a, a th that was originally a hotel. Vanguard Studios was the ballroom to that hotel. It turned into an apartment. Uh, right, you know, which is now later. the New York uh, New York Gotham Comedy Club. That's what it is yes, now, and yes, they do a lot of yes. live broadcasts from there. So that space is still there. It was a massive space, but as electronic musicians, we only used the control room because we didn't need to set up big mics. Uh, but yeah, you, yeah, yeah. but you could put an orchestra in there if you if you had to. So how did you get into Vanguard? And then we'll talk about you know. So uh, so basically, I was just sending out resumes uh, when I had come back uh, from New York uh, from London and. Uh, just started uh, pounding on doors again, and uh, I sent one down to Vanguard, and, and uh, Vanguard called me. I went in, I did an interview. Uh, they liked me, and uh, and then they uh, they hired me, and I started doing, uh, you know, uh, as an Vanguard. engineer, right? They hired you as yeah, an engineer. Yeah, yeah, strictly as an engineer, as an engineer yeah. because you had uh, so basically this, this piece of I paper. I started out, you know, I was doing tape copies. They had a huge, uh, huge library, as you know. Uh, so I was doing, you know, if somebody, if a licensee in Germany wanted a copy of the new Joan Baez record, I would make the reel-to-reel -reel time copy, and and send and send that up to the fourth floor and mail it out. I remember next to the uh, rec uh, the, the control room, there was this side room that had. A, a, a temporary library of current yeah, acts, yeah, yeah. and I had to go in there over several times and steal my masters because I know Mike Wilkinson <laughs> wouldn't give it to me, so I'd come with a big shopping bag, which didn't, of course, fit, match my shoes, but I would walk in there with a shopping bag <laughs> or, or a backpack, and while you yeah, guys yeah. were working, I would pretend to go out to the bathroom, sneak around, go into that room, and I would t pull my... I had, Hip Hop Bebop 24 Master and some of them, and I would take it out and put it in the bag because I know I was getting screwed and I'd never get it. <laughs> so I have them somewhere, you know, in my storage thing. But yeah, yeah I remember that quite well, you know what I mean? So I I, uh, I started out in the tape copy room up there because they had four other studios at uh, oh, really? uh, 78 uh, uh, oh. 23rd Street, all right? Oh. Uh, the main offices, you know where the offices are, they're on 6th Avenue yeah, they, and 23rd. Yeah, where the Mason's uh, thing was. Yeah, the Mason's, yeah. My dad was floor. a Mason, so that's how I know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so the third floor was all the offices. Right. The fourth floor, third floor was all the offices and the Mason's Grand Lodge. And the fourth floor was the actual Didn't you guys use library. the Grand Lodge sometimes as a recording uh, thing? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Wow. Yeah. wow. Joe Jackson did a record there. We did a record with Yo-Yo Ma, the uh, world-famous cellist. Wow, wow. Um, how, yeah, did a lot. So, so was that wired for sound, or did, was it just a portable? You know, set up some mics. No, we had, we ran a huge cable, uh, and the control room. We had four other studios at 71 West 23rd Street, which is where the offices were. So we had four other studios, of which three were probably control rooms, and we just ran a cable, a mic cable, into the and recorded uh, in there. Amazing. And uh, Amazing. yeah, just went out, went like going out the back door, running a cable. So how did um so. The Vanguard went from a jazz place to this 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 focus point of early electronic hip hop music. How, I yeah. mean, you were there, but how did how did that happen? Did was Van Vanguard actually started out as a uh, uh, it was actually a folk label. Vanguard was, right. was the only jazz, label right. that had three acts that played at Woodstock in in 1969. So they had Joan Baez, Buffy St. Marie, and Country Joe and the Fish. Right, and so I know all those. So here's this. Here's this small little independent label cranking out three major you know, artists. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anti-war, yeah. anti-war stuff because Maynard was a card-carrying communist, yeah. <laughs> and, and and he was like anti, anti, anti. Right? And he had Pete Seeger and you know all these anti-war. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. they had three acts that played in front of half a million people. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like yeah, come yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean that was that was groundbreaking back then. So. Yeah. That increased the value of the catalog tremendously. They so, got into more into jazz. Right, that I know. Uh, I know it is a jazz uh, label, yeah. And then how jazz. did it become a? How did it become a pop baby for, for for Soul Sonic Force and you know New Edition? Okay, so, and how, so how did that uh, happen? I was, I was born in Massachusetts, uh, and uh, we actually met each other, uh, Arthur and I, through John Roby. So wait, wait. So, John, so, so, so uh, Arthur is from Boston. I just want to let people know that. So yeah, Arthur from Boston. I was born in Northampton. So we were both born in Massachusetts. So 
Uh, I used to do a lot of work for Eddie O'Loughlin at Next Plateau, who had uh, salt and pepper. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, Eddie was a great guy. Yeah, gave me, yeah, yeah. gave me a lot of breaks. And, and he would send me down records to mix. And I'd say, a nice, a nice okay, Irish boy, yeah. A nice Irish hey, guy. Give yeah. me a thousand bucks, Eddie. Yeah, and I, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. it mixed his whole record for a thousand bucks. Yeah, well, we all did. It was did great. You. You got a thousand, I got a hundred. I remember those days. <laughs> and, and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, no, I didn't get the money. I mean, Vanguard, the label, got the money, and I got the experience. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. that's how that's how I looked at it. So, so next so, plateau uh, was more of a street label, and that started to filter into your world, so to speak. Right, and then right. John Roby and Eddie O'Loughlin were good buddies, and then John Roby came down and did overdubs on Eddie O Records, and then John Roby brought this guy Arthur Baker. To the studio with all the Soul Sonic Force stuff, right. um, and then Arthur and I hit it off because we were. So the Soul Sonic Force and all that was done. Was that done there? Because I know that that I heard that Tom Silverman spent everybody's money on a Fairlight or a Fairlight or Sinclair or, or no, no, something I, like I, that. I used to do a lot of work. Uh, actually, Eddie O'Loughlin introduced me to Tommy Silverman, and. Uh, but and wasn't that we were, was, wasn't Planet Rock or some of that stuff done on a Fairlight or or or, or Sinclair or, or something that Tommy had? No, the, no this was all pre-Fairlight. Well, what well, that orchestra hit is it, it, it was that from? Oh, that's a, an that's emulator. A, uh, emulator correct right and i was one of the first people in new york city to have an emulator one which yeah. which yeah. which weighed i mean it was big as a and weighed as much as a ham and organ it's probably a hundred pounds and this giant yeah, yeah, yeah. massive box on wheels and it took two people to take it out of the case and it had yeah. five inch floppy disk and a half a second of audio at i think eight case uh, you know like like one third of, yeah the of, fidelity coming out was Horrendous. It was horrendous. horrible. And a lot of noise in it, too. But if you slammed it, it sounded great. If you yeah, slammed yeah. it and peaked yeah. it out. So, and we got some great sounds out of it, even on uh, even on the Man Parish records. We got some great sounds, you know? Well, I was lucky. I recorded on an 8-track half-inch. I carried it in, and I remember being really fussy. I wanted to get it direct to the machine without putting it through a lot of equipment. And you and I had mentioned this in the pre-phone call leading up to this conversation. The great thing about Vanguard Studios is it didn't have a ton of outboard gear, and it didn't have a lot of stuff. It was a not a bare bones, but it was a one up from a bare bones studio. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I remember yeah. we had to rent an even tied digital delay because it didn't have it, right? And you had right. a you had a plate, no spring, you had a plate reverb in the back somewhere, you know, this yeah, big yeah. long yeah. box. Out, by the, out, out and back by the bathroom. Yeah, so you, you know, in, in the movies, kids, when you see kids, people, when you see them, they shake that big piece of tin and they make thunder. Well, it's more or less something like that where they had a big plate in there, a microphone on one side, a, 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 a speaker on the other, and they would send sound through this plate that would reverb or, or, or vibrate, and that was the reverbs back in those and we days. And we used to have to run out and, and turn the uh, yeah. handle to change to change the length of the yeah. delay. Yeah, because it would literally bend the piece of metal, so the so, yep. so the, the the vibrations would only go this far instead of this far and make a yeah, shorter yeah, room yeah. and stuff like that. But it was a great sound in that place because it was it, there wasn't a lot of signal path and a lot of noise. There was an MCI, which was made by Sony Board, and machine, right. which looked like a washer machine sitting back here, you know. And in those so days, you, you had to go in and you had to uh, you had to go in and you had to tune the um, bias. And I want to let people know what that is. You had to take a little screwdriver and control the voltage on each individual track, yeah. so it recorded yeah, yeah. perfectly for that particular tape. And there were things at the beginnings of the tape called test tones, which were references. So if you took your 24 track to another studio, they would play back those tones and set it for zero. So your right. tape sounded in one studio like another studio. And there's a famous story of an engineer. What was the studio below Studio 54? It was... Um, oh, that was uh, Soundworks. Somebody, uh, they went to Soundworks and it was Toto. And the engineer put on what he thought was a wrong... A, you know, a, 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 a reference tape, and he wiped out all of Toto, Toto's masters uh, that they worked for like months on. Oh, I heard, yeah. I heard that story. I heard that story. Yeah, yeah, yes, the, the, yes. Good, the good old days. So, you know, don't worry about losing files. We even did it back then, but just physically. <laughs>
Um, oh man. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let's so let's go through. Uh, you work with uh, Arthur Baker, uh, looking for the perfect beat. Uh, Planet Patrol, play at your own risk. Awesome, right. awesome. Funky Soul Makosa, new edition. Candy Girl, Jelly Bean stuff. Arthur Baker, Freeze, A E I O U, which I yeah. love. Eddie O'Loughlin, yeah. uh, uh, Next Plateau. John Roby, C Bank, One More Shot. Tommy Silverman, which all the Tommy Boy records. Import 12, which is me. And it says, and Man Paris, the ground making hip hop beep hop. It's right there in uh, the Wikipedia. Absolutely. What was that like? I mean, here I was this, 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 this. Dumb, uh, how you doing? I'm from Brooklyn, kid. That's coming in <laughs> with a tape recorder and puts this stuff up, and it's like, what the fuck? I tell people there was no verse or chorus in hip hop bebop. It was we just opened microphones. I remember. What did you say? I can't. Uh, uh, you're on there with me and Raul. We had no lyrics. I think I, I did the I did the high pitched laugh. <laughs> And yeah. a couple of other things, yeah, yeah, yeah. and a couple of other things that are in there. And that song, when it was mixed down, we had no structure. So we 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 would leave the drums and then a bass and then and then record that to two inch tape and then go back and do keyboards, bass, drums, and percussion and take that to two inch tape. And they walked out with two uh, master reels of pieces of hip hop bebop. And Raul and Mike went, you know, back to his apartment right, and yeah. did coke and MDA and, and beer all weekend yeah, 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 and yeah. would slice tape with razors. And if you looked at the tape, there were like, it wasn't scotch tape, but it would look like scotch tape all over for these pieces of music. And that would spin through and then get recorded to another tape recorder as the final version. I, I of think that uh, with Hip Hop Bebop, I think we all knew that it's uh, a piece of shit and yeah. we gotta save it <laughs> yeah i know i think we all knew that it was a a special recording well wait a minute i well, yeah is that what we call a special recording <laughs> <laughs> well I, you know i mean we were just listen no many seriously we were all we were doing like the most insane shit on records nobody was doing what barking on records yeah i know i well I but, have... and, and that was meant to that was meant to be specifically cater to a dance audience. So I right? want to tell when people, they heard that barking, yeah. they went, oh my I, God. I, I, I tell the story. We used to go, my role took me to the fun house and to the Fever in the Bronx. And yeah. when people like the record, they go, ooh, ooh, ooh. And a lot of people think Arsenio Hall started that on his talk show, but he didn't. He took right. it from the streets. So when it came down to doing records, it's like, what are we going to do? We don't have a vocal. Raul said, come on, let's bark and ooh, ooh, ooh. Those are not samples. Those are not dogs in the studio. That's us barking right, on the right. record because yeah, we didn't absolutely. think the record would go anywhere past a, little, a small little 12 inch and we just wanted to bring it to jelly bean which we did and his girlfriend was standing next to him this girl with black hair and hairy armpits with a t-shirt that said i'm madonna uh, you know she'd say and right, we right, put right. the record on and it barked and people barked back and i went oh great our record's done we don't have to go anywhere this is all this is going to be which was great you know what i mean so um i had a lot of issues with hip-hop bebop because and it didn't have a verse it didn't have a chorus I came from rock and roll, and I came from electronic music, so I wanted to be like, not Ultravox, I wanted to be like, you know, some of those Euro bands, Erasure, I wanted to have songs, and here's Hip Hop Beep Hop, and I kept, you can't put this record out, there's no verse and chorus, people are going to laugh at me, you know, it just, it's unprofessional, and, you know, bang, and look, what was, yeah, what, yeah. what did you think, you know, people... Had you already worked with Arthur Baker, so you were custom to 808s by then? Was I one of yeah, the yeah, first yeah. people? I, I had already done quite a bit of work with Arthur and Eddie uh, and John. Uh, so, the, so me bringing so, in some stuff was was totally within your, you know, within well, your... Well, I, 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 I knew that sound. I knew that sound very, very well. You know, and, and we had that one little Neve... Neve EQ unit that we put, you know, put yeah. the stuff in. We had that one LA2A compressor, you know. So one, we kind folks, of, one. <laughs> one, 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 just one, one. Not, not 128. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, just one because so, they were cheap. Yeah. So we, here we are constructing this record, one track phase at a time, at a time through these beautiful. Now, you know, I, I want to say something about that. We didn't have Simti. Uh, was there Simti back in those days? If there was Simti, then... There, we, there, there was Simti, yes. But we couldn't synchronize that yet to sequences. Roland didn't make that box. So no. when no. we... I spent many times with Mark, and this was a rough one. Um, if I'd lay down the drums and the bass at the same time because the 808 would put out a pulse and trigger the sequencer in my Pro 1, and we were able to synchronize drums and bass. But when you have two things that are going like this, if not perfectly in sync, they will fall out of sync. So we would right. record 12 bars, roll it back, and I would stop, start the next, the third track, 
with the drum machine triggering a new sequence sound. And we do 12 right. bars, roll it back a few, and then go a little bit more and roll it, and finally get another track. And we would go 18, 20 tracks of these keyboard overlays by hand. It was like or, or needle we point, mark, you know. We, we would record it on half a uh, quarter inch tape, and then mark the tape, and then start the tape right when it's when the multi-track is playing and we want that overdub on the quarter inch onto the master we we hit the fucking but 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 you'd have to hit that and hit play and record on the other machine all yeah, simultaneously yeah. so it was a yeah. real hand craft those are handcrafted so uh, songs absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. yeah absolutely absolutely yeah, we were in the trenches yeah. with that kind of stuff um uh so arthur baker did he reuse some of his tracks, uh, like uh, Planet well, Rock? So on the, some so of the these story other... with Arthur, Arthur goes. Uh, oh, tell the story uh, about uh, when we heard my stuff and he slammed. Yeah, that. so uh, so we all used a a, a a brilliant, brilliant mastering Herbie engineer Powers. in New York named Herbie Herbie Powers. In fact. It was Raul and I that nicknamed him the Pump. And we used to go so. up there and we used to make him write on the... If you could find original Man Paris records, he would write stuff on the inner... The space between the last groove and the yes, label. Yes, yes, yes. So we would have him write stuff like 12 black inches in a hole and, you know, uh, Yo Mama <laughs> and all that. So if you yeah. find an original record and you hold it up to the light, there's little little messages in a lot yeah. of those originals. Yeah. And... Uh, Herbie worked for a company called um, Frankfurt Wayne. Frankfurt Wayne, that, yeah, I couldn't remember. That was the mastering yeah, company, yeah, uh, right. uh, com uh, guys that were doing doing it all. So it was Herbie and Tommy Coyne that were the main mastering guys. Tommy did a lot of the rock stuff. Herbie did yeah, it was um, a lot of the urban stuff. So um, Arthur used them uh, as well. And, and Herbie was up there. The story goes, Herbie was up there playing hip-hop bebop, which he mastered. And uh, it just fucking sounded killer. It did, and, and, and it's because of you, absolutely, definitely. And, you know, people ask me, how did you get that sound? I said, I just turned the knob until it sounded good. And I remember I had a couple of fights, oh, yeah. I said, you can't do that. And I said, well, yes, I am. But you yeah, knew yeah. that that vinyl had, had grooves, and if you put too much bass, the needle would jump off. So you knew, I wanted this pumping bass, you did too, but you knew where to keep it within those boundaries. So right. it didn't, right. you know, it, some records were unplayable, you know what I mean? And you made sure that yeah, that yeah, was but, but Herbie put that, uh, Herbie had number one had great ears. Yes. Uh, and and Herbie always put that icing on the cake. Yeah, you know, he was he, a, he really he, did. He was a funky black dude and delivered. Yeah. You know, the, the, he 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 got the. He had it. great ears. You man. know, yeah. You know. If you went to Paradise Garage, that bass stopped your breath. You know, and it was like, oh, oh, you yeah. knew when yeah. his records came on, everything sounded tin. And if you were in a big place with a Richard Long sound system, that bass would come in and oh, he knew how to get to the bottom cabinets. And Absolutely. Really that. Absolutely. Yeah, he yeah. was a uh, he was a brilliant. So, he still, I, I I believe he still is in the uh, in the business. Uh, oh really? Wow. I, he's down, I think he's down in Florida. I'll have to reach out to him. He's I'm in Florida. I'm yeah, between New York and Florida. Uh, so Arthur Baker took the record and came back to you. So he came back with the masters of uh, of uh, looking for the looking for the perfect beat. So wait a minute. So there's a rumor of looking for the perfect beat because there's dark box on there that Arthur was a little. I'm going to ask him if he comes on, and I'd love to get him to come on. That looking for the perfect beat was a battle disc record to me because. You know they're doing the perfect beat and I'm doing this thing. And they have dog barks and similar a uh, couple of right, keyboard right, right, So right. it's supposed to be one of these. You know I'm the king of this. You're not man Paris. So you're looking for the perfect beat. So you know that's the I, rumor I, you know, that I, I, I heard. Say, there, there was there I were was the engineer of, of 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 all this stuff, right? So there was competition. Yeah, of course there was competition. Yeah. I remember Arthur coming back from Herbie's, and he walks in the fucking control room and he he takes the fucking masters and he. Ah, Slams the masters on the table, and he goes, "I just fucking heard hip hop bebop. How come this doesn't sound like that?" <laughs> well, I recorded that on a track half inch tape on a task cam, so you know what I mean. I, I didn't know what I was doing, but I mean, the path from there to the twenty four yeah, track, yeah. It, it, it you, you know what I mean? It, it, it was a different recording. Different. It was nothing that you did. You know what I mean? I came in with the very basics of that. You know what I mean? And Herbie did his thing. So I'm sorry, Arthur. You know, didn't mean to upset you, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> cool, cool, yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. No, it was it was good. It was you know because these were records that were really big recordings. They were like yeah, I know. I never got paid on that. I sold, these were these were international smash. I sold five million records and another eighty or eighty five through uh, Grand Theft Auto, which uh, there's a whole other story that we don't talk about. But you know that that was big stuff. 
And I remember a little Jewish girl with a big nose from Brooklyn called Alicia, who's her absolute sweetheart, and her husband, her husband, her father, Al. Al, Big Al. Big Al, who was her manager. So, uh, so and they lived about stories. 30 blocks from me in Brooklyn. And, That's right. Yeah, you know, Alicia, I thought for a while, wound up like kind of supporting the family from all the stuff that she did, right? I mean, she was going yeah, out yeah, and doing well, shit. Uh, Alicia was brought to me through, uh, I had a song called All Night Passion, and I would beg Maynard to produce. I said, Maynard, let me produce. And I'd, I'd highlight the Billboard Hot uh, 100 dance charts, and I'd highlight all the records I make. So at one point, I had 10% of the chart as a mixer, right? How cool is that? Yeah. yeah. That's cool. So I slide it under Maynard's door, right? And Maynard go, what the fuck is this? I go, Maynard, I was like, I'm, I'm, I want to be a producer. Let me fucking produce. Yeah. It's not a... You know, Bill, keep billing at the studio. You're doing a great job. <laughs> That's all he was right. He just wanted to pay me yeah, to pay, help pay the note. Right. So that was cool. So so then I, I found this song called All Night Passion. Betty Oshinsky was head of accounting at Vanguard, and she was neighbors to the Itkins. So they uh, put uh, us... That's Alicia's last name, by the way. Itkin, yeah. yeah so, yeah. Uh, and, you know, Betty would get her gas at the gas station where Al, Al owned and worked at. Um, and then they, they put us together. So... We kind of hit it off, and I had this song, All Night Passion. Like, I mean, God forbid I'd record a song like All Night Passion by a 15-year-old today. <laughs> yeah, I get yeah, fucking, yeah, exactly. I get fucking Well, Alicia was, Alicia was only 15 at the time? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we maybe talking All Night Passion? All right. And I remember we rented, uh, you brought in Michael Wadetsky, who's a friend of mine, the guy who passed away in Boy George's house. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, and we rented the Fairlight, which was a $100,000 sampler. Yeah. Uh, which yep, was used yep. on Order Noise, uh, Michael Jackson. We can go down. Uh, and Frankie goes to Hollywood. Uh, it was this. It was this monster. I mean, it, it, it was a massive CPU and these big terminal, and you had a. With the, how about the the big discs? The, the big, big discs the big. Uh, those were not. Uh, those were floppies. Uh, floppy. Yeah, the big five and a half inch floppy. No, yeah, no, yeah. no, 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 no. They were larger than five and a half floppies. Or was five and a half the only size that time? Because of the same thing, I put in an emulator. Anyway, we put them in. It was a two-second sample rate, slightly better than an emulator. Uh, and the reason why people liked it is it had eight-track digital primitive tape recorder in it. So you can, instead of recording two tracks in sync, we can now record eight. And everything yeah. would synchronize. And Michael came over to my house in Brooklyn. We'd rent it on a Friday night from, was it called the Toy Specialist, I think? The, the place? Toy Specialist, the yeah, toy yeah, specialist. yeah, on 24th Street. Yeah, right? yeah for, uh, there was, I thought it was 48th. Anyway, anyway whatever. That was, that, that was SIR. For SIR. Was. Between one of the, not SIR, there was another place by, by the Coke. Anyway, whatever it was, we would rent it. Rent it. They would ship it out to Brooklyn. We, we were smart. If we rented it on a Friday night, it was $100. They were closed Saturday and Sunday, so we could do it on yeah, Monday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'd lay the yeah. stuff down and then go into the go into Vanguard like you know either early Monday morning before we had to return it or or, or, or late over the weekend and just print those eight tracks to tape yeah. and the, yeah. you know for for, for for all night passion and baby talk and I remember doing the bass lines on that particular record at my house in Brooklyn you know what I mean yeah. so that was that was some really 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 cool stuff so the Alicia the Alicia stuff was like me just wanting to be a producer because I was this engineer that was had my name on a lot of records that were very, very successful. So I went to Maynard. Finally, he gave me 3,500 bucks to go make a record and said, if I, if I. That's a lot. We used to do it for 500 bucks. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen. listen <laughs> Including Maynard said, paying listen, Vanguard Studios. If I fuck it up, he's going to take it out of my salary. Wow. <laughs> wow. You had a lot of money. So, you had a lot of money. So, uh, yeah, it was a lot of money back then. So I made this record, All Night Passion, came out. KTU jumped on it right away. Um, WKTU and uh, the rest is history. You know how I got uh, my stuff on KTU? Uh, I used to do all the vocoder 92 KTU that robot oh, really? that went out to millions of people. You remember that? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. That, yeah. that was me. So we could bring anything wow. into KTU, and they would put as long as it didn't have curse words, they would drop a needle on it and, and put it into heavy rotation. So we did a form of payola. Right. You know what I mean? Great, great. And, yeah, and, yeah, 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 and, yeah. and because of that, Carlos Tejas, who's the program director, loved me because I gave him the, the station an ID. That ID ran yeah. for about two or three years. So if you lived in New York and heard the robot, I was the first person to do vocoder. I remember uh, that. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that was me. It says, and then you moved to the uh, area seven-inch uh, dance and rocks mixing for major platinum yeah, artists. So, uh, so we Vanguard, have David B Vanguard Bowie. Vanguard got sold. I, I worked at Vanguard for uh, almost 11 years. Uh, and uh, Vanguard got sold. I started doing independent production uh, around the world. 
uh, Paul Schindler, my attorney, I know. Uh, still, yeah, my, yeah, yeah, yeah. still my attorney, uh, would send me to Michael Gadinsky, who ran Mushroom Records in Australia. Oh, and, yeah, uh, yeah, I remember that label. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, up here, kids in the uh, kitchen, uh, studio echo, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tony Sabdaris up here in Canada, who managed the, you know, the Bon Jovi of Canada called Platinum Blonde. Yeah. So he sent me to around the world. And I'd, I'd be making records around the world, and and it became very, very uh, popular. Um, uh, in demand, work with Bowie, Duran Duran, yes, Boy George, Billy Idol, Cool in the Game, Toto, yes, uh, yeah, yeah. The uh, works. So, the so works. wait a second. So the Boy George record that you did was Spirit in the Sky. Now, that was a record that Michael and I did in Brooklyn. We performed at the Palladium. It was supposed right. to come out, and they didn't put it out. And then suddenly, George put it out as his right. record with Marilyn. Well, I did two George records. I did one for the uh, so, uh, the movie Live in My Life. Right. So I did uh, the soundtrack uh, to that record. I mixed that. And you did and then, Spirit in course, the Sky. Spirit in the Sky. Yeah, yeah, which, which he basically, Maryland. he never paid me and Michael for. We did all the work on that. Uh, my right. friend, do you know Steve Remote? Uh, he's got the remote truck yeah, in New York. Yeah, yeah, anyway, yeah. so Steve pulled his truck into my driveway, and George came out to Brooklyn. It's a whole, if, if you go to my Mayfair stories, there's a whole story there. But uh, yeah, that was a record that I worked on that I never got paid, my right. mine never got paid for, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I did that for uh, uh, a while, the independent stuff, which I really loved, and I've been independent ever since. So now the company is. Uh, so let's talk you about know. your company. So you have attack group of companies, you moved up to Toronto. You have all this great uh, stuff. The company's called AMG, and right. AMG is a music, film, and television company. So we, I started putting a lot of music into film and TV as well. Licensing uh, or producing it or getting other people Licensing. Stuff? Licensing. Licensing, great. Okay. Uh, licensing, you know, straight sourcing mm -hmm. of music. So I had a deal with Alliance Atlantis, which is a, a monster movie company yeah. here mm -hmm. at the time in, in Canada, and uh, started working on major motion pictures, uh, Matrix Reloaded, Coach Carter, Brokeback Mountain, Spider-Man. Yeah, I noticed major Brokeback Mountain. I noticed they gave you a gay gay pride uh, bracelet you have around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was that your present from uh, Brokeback Mountain? Okay, good. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I did that, and uh, and then I got into uh, I was still producing uh, records, and then I got into uh, doing music for television, supplying music for a lot of MTV program, uh, BET programming. Great. Um, and then uh, BMG bought my publishing company they bought they own 50 percent of my music publishing company Good for you. uh through a company called cherry lane um, Good for you. now i know how to call when i need a loan i gotta call you, yeah, you go. that's great <laughs> and then, congratulations uh, about three years ago somebody walked in my office with a movie on drake and uh i executive produced uh, the homecoming movie and we got 1400 theaters internationally through amc yeah. um yeah. Uh, through a company called spectacast which is their specialty film division um and we did uh, 1,400 theaters worldwide Good. Uh, over two nights. And then uh, I remember now. It. Yeah. Now we're doing um, the man uh, Parrish movie. Uh, hey, I'm ready. Uh, I'm ready, baby. Let's go, do it. Go look at my stories. Go sell it to somebody. You know, hey, go make yeah. some money. I've got some crazy shit there. You know what I mean? So, wow. Yeah. So yeah, I did yeah. that. And now we're doing uh, we've got Rockstar Kitchen, uh, What's that? which is basically uh, it's a cooking show uh, Good. backstage. You know, uh, is it is it out? Yeah, it's 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 already a functioning series, but it's kind of been morphed. It's been changed. Uh, Where is it? Bringing, uh, is it on? It's on a network. Or? It's on the Mid Atlantic states about uh, five six years ago through Comcast. I sort so, of remember that because I have yeah, Comcast, yeah. so I kind of remember that. I remember the yeah. title, seeing it. It's a very popular yeah. show. It yeah, yeah. It up, dusted it off, kind of gave it a new facelift. It's now Backstage Kitchen, uh, which is. Uh, backstage, a little kitchen setup. We got Chris Santos. Hey, Shopping if you ever need Ball. a dishy queen to come in and just you know to destroy somebody, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, I'm available. <laughs> and basically, it's all backstage, and then they run on stage and do the uh, do the show. So. so you you've taken what you're you're recording and and you're producing, and you've spun it into something much bigger, which is great. Do you still produce? Do you still record? Yeah, or actually, you, or, or is this like too. a big enough thing where you gotta sit at this desk with Spider Man and those great things behind you? <laughs> Those cold, I gotta do. I gotta do a, a couple of records a year. I still love it. Uh, I didn't follow the digital curve, right? Uh, as an engineer. So if uh, you do it analog, practice. that's awesome. That because you yeah, know, yeah. the retro movement is really. You know, there's other people out there, Manny, that do it better than I do it. So uh, technically, so 
I um, had to because of cost. I had a two-inch machine in, in my house. Uh, I, I was on Dream Records with my friend Steve Pickett. My master bedroom, I pulled everything out of it, and I had a two-inch machine in there. And I literally had an engineer that slept on the floor on a sleeping uh, bag next to it because it went down every four or five hours because the room got too hot. So I, yeah, I said, yeah. I can't do this anymore. And I went over towards the digital realm, you know what I mean? Because it, this is ridiculous. Yeah. And my first digital, back in the days when we used to cut um, uh, records with, with, with uh, Razors. I had the first digital thing. I had a Mac 2 CI. I think I had 128 megabyte driver or something like that. And I had the um, sound designer audio to digital converter box. Uh -huh. And it would put it uh -huh. up in the sound designer program. And we can do all those stutter edits instead of cutting with a machine. You can cut right, it on. Right. And it cost $11,000. <laughs> can, we, can we pause for just a minute? Maybe the FedEx is here. I, actually, go ahead. Why don't you do that? And I'll keep talking yeah, yeah. to people. Hold on. Just one second. You got it. Mark Berry is so busy that he gets FedEx. There you go. So, folks, just hang on a second. I wish there was a live stream going here because you guys can ask him questions, but we'll figure out where Mark's, um, uh, um, how you can get in touch with him if you have questions or if he's got a Facebook site and all that. I wish we could zoom in on some of these things back there, but, you know, Mark's done a lot of stuff. It says uh, he controls the worldwide master rights to the first... Frank Sinatra single called Our Love, recorded in 1939 when uh, Sinatra was 19. Uh, and he's got rights associated with the master uh, and featured in a... Uh, I'll ask him about it. Well, instead of me reading some of this stuff, which is not always accurate, uh, we'll do that and then we'll ask him to play one, two, three. And I think uh, we're pretty much done. We've got a, uh, an hour, an hour and a half uh, interview here. But um, I want to see if I can get in here and see uh, David Bowie. He did uh, uh, Talk Talk, uh, 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 Duran Duran, Yes, Billy Idol, Pseudo Echo. He mentioned Kids in the Kitchen, uh, Joan Jett, you know, Cherry Bomb. That was a big record I used to lift, uh, listen to. Uh, cool and the Gang. Uh, he did Fresh. Uh, let's see, uh, Boy George, Rip It Up, and... Uh, um, uh, Annabelle from Bow Wow Wow, Ian Dury and the Blockheads. Oh my God, I used to, I, I used to, I used to love that stuff. Uh, Mink Deville, uh, Nona Hendrix, uh, Cameo, uh, Stephanie Mills, Gwen Guthrie, uh, the Barkays, uh, 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 Freeze. I can go on and on and on and on and on and on and on with this kind of stuff. Um, we're running and. Uh, Hey, Mark, did you run to the bathroom? Can you hear me? We can finish this up. There he goes. He's coming back in. Sorry about that. It's all right. I've been giving everybody a little uh, background. This is still running and, uh, and all that. I, I just read some of the stuff. Just real quick, I, I want to finish this up, but um, you got the rights to the first Frank Sinatra track? Yes, through a guy named Larry Sikora. Why would you? Hey, which was, hey, how you doing? You want to buy some <laughs> yeah, yeah. to a track? Well, it was, it was a... He had bought the masters from um, from the original Fra the the orchestra that Frank sang for before he became Frank Sinatra. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. You know, I just yeah. saw Blade Runner twenty forty nine or whatever. Did you see that movie? And Frank Sinatra pops I up in as a hologram. There's a whole thing. I don't want to spoil it for you or anybody else, but they go to Las Vegas, and Las Vegas is now you know like like a, like an after after the bomb goes off. And right, right. Um, uh, one of the characters is living in the top of the hotel, and he has a holographic thing where Frank Sinatra pops up. So uh, may, hang on to that. Maybe you could, uh, uh, you know, do the Frank Sinatra hologram yeah, 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 yeah. in, in, in right. some future day. It's great speaking with you. I do. A, I, I want to ask you how people can get in touch with you. And we also do okay. a little game called One Two Three. You don't have to play it, but I'll tell you what it is. It's one of three evils, and you're fucked either way. You get asked the most filthy, dirty, sexual question, or Ever in an interview, or you could sing a chorus or a verse of your favorite song, or um, oh my God, I can't remember the third one. Wait, uh, is that the, I can't remember the third one, so we can't play this. Holy shit! Well, we could asking you a dirty question. You get to sing a song, or oh, you have to make the most disgusting fart noise with your mouth or your <laughs> ass. So this is a little bit of fun. This is my shtick. You, you can play one, two, three. You can say, hey, I, 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 I'm looking at my watch and I got to go, so I'll do it later. 
Your choice. <laughs> you know, I actually got to go. Oh, okay, here we go. How do people get in touch with you? So you, so you decline. Okay, so, so, so how do people get yeah, in touch so, with you? Is, is there a website? Okay, so is there a Facebook we have a corporate. We have a corporate website called theamgcorp.com, okay. T-H-E-A-M-G-C-O-R-P.com. Uh, they can reach me through Mark at the AMG Corp, Mark with a K, Great. or info at the AMG Corp dot com. Are you on Facebook or any of those kind of things? Uh, yeah, we're on, I'm on Facebook as Mark S. Berry. Great. Um, and that's more of a um, that's a business site as well. You know, but my yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and uh, that's about it. We well, do Facebook, um, and we have you know all the social media stuff for the for the company, Instagram and stuff. Like well, yeah, we got the Facebook and the uh, Instagram, you know, and all the kids use. <laughs> Mark, I can't thank you enough for being amazing and uh, for having this unbelievable career. I'm, I'm insanely jealous. But out of all those really big names, you know, uh, uh, Mick Jagger and all these big names at least, and George Morton, who, by the way, produced the Beatles. If you don't know, you got to look that up. Uh, you got to work with Man Parrish, so that's the most important out of all. Absolutely. There you Absolutely. go. Hey, you know what? Uh, it was a great experience working with you. Uh, it was great success that we had together. Yeah. yeah. Uh, love, love you like a brother. We're Thank both you. From Brooklyn. Lo We're yeah. both from Brooklyn. Love you and, like a sister. Uh, we got it. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I will talk to you soon. Thank you so much for everything. Okay, you got it, buddy. Take care, guys. Take care, buddy. Bye-bye.